one of the best things about this is you get to meet some fantastic people. I am now here with two of the three Wilson sisters. Welcome, Amanda and Kelly. Uh, last time viewers saw you, you were probably working some extraordinary magic and transforming some of those Kaimanawa wild horses. You've been on a lot of adventures since then. What have you been up to? Uh, well, we've been very, very busy because the TV series came out in 2015. So we've had five years of some insane adventures working with more wild horses around the world. Um, we've done a lot of show jumping and riding and travelling and, yeah, it's been pretty cool. I had a theory it was going to pretty much be horse-based, whatever yeah, it was yeah. that you were doing. Yeah. For people who, who maybe didn't see you on Keeping Up With The Quiet Manor, was, give us a little bit of background. What, was, what happened with that series? What's your background? Uh, so I guess our very first time on TV was Country Calendar and we were mostly show jumping back then. And then in 2012, we got involved with saving New Zealand's wild, New Zealand's wild horses. And it was really life-changing for us. We loved working with them and giving them a second chance at life. And then it snowballed and has ended up becoming like a really global passion for any wild horses anywhere. How are we getting on with the, with the wild horses these days? Because for a long time, I, you know, you'd go to AMP shows and things, and there'd always be someone there raising money for the wild horses or trying to rehome horses. Where are we at now? Well, actually, since um, our TV show came out in 2015, every single horse suitable to be rehomed has been saved from slaughter, which is phenomenal. Um, and obviously now there's a muster every year. Uh, so the next one is in March, April 2021. Right. What makes them different from horses that you've seen overseas? I would say there's not a huge amount of difference. Uh, with the Kaimana, was we're, we're getting them out of the wild, so they're very, very different to work with. We've come to the conclusion that out of the Mustangs in America and the Brumbies in Australia, that Kaimana was the hardest, um, just because of how they're managed. Like Kaimanas, they're, coming, they're getting mustered in, they're getting put on a truck and arriving at your property the next day. In America, they're actually brought in out of the wild, put into BLM yards, and then you can go in and select them so they know what fences are and troughs and all the rest, and it's quite similar with the Brumbies. But in terms of how they behave, it's pretty... Um... Like a wild horse is a wild horse, really, wherever you go. Right, yeah. so kind of kicking and They're... biting and yeah. standing up. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, in different parts of the world, as well as depending on what predators and stuff they have, they can behave a little differently, but for the most part, they're pretty similar. Uh, we do have uh, some footage of some of your time in the States as well with the Mustangs. Let's have a look at that now. This is the two- and three-year-old yard. These guys have been in here for about a year or so. Some of them have been born in here as well. So we were really surprised by the Mustangs. They are very different to the New Zealand wild horses initially. Uh, the Kaimanawas are living in freedom. They're very proud and they have the most perfect place to live. And when we got to America, they're all in what we'd call prison cells. They're living in government holding yards. And so when we took those Mustangs out, they were so eager and excited to be outside and to learn new things that they gave us everything they could. This thing's way too sweet, isn't she? It's kind of a little bit surprisingly grim, those yards. Yeah, it was really shocking for us because obviously we grew up watching, um, you know, Micah and Flicker and, you know, and movies about the Wild West. And so you imagine, like, plains and ranges with wild horses. And unfortunately, about half of the wild horses in America are in these holding yards. Good Lord. What do they do with them in there? Well, basically, they've got a certain quota that they're allowed out in the wild. And so when they get over that quota, the government does big musters and they go in there. And the idea, um, th there's an anti-slaughter rule with the Mustangs. And so the government kind of stockpiles in there and the public can go in and um, you can buy them for about $125. And if they're second strike horses, which means that they've been rehomed but had to be sent back, then they're $25 and third strike horses are $10. What do you do with a $10 horse? Well, the thing is, even at that price, no one... They yeah. Can't so, keep up with demand. I mean, no. there's 45, 50,000 horses in these yards in America. And I think at it's costing 82 million for taxpayers yeah. every year just to look after these Mustangs. Crikey. Yeah. Because, of course, I remember the, you know, the famous book I was reading it to my daughter the other day, Wild Horse Annie, who, who, you know, they were basically just rounding these horses up and slaughtering them for, you know, yeah. pet food and things like that, and they were going to wipe them out, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. This is a sort of, I guess, unintended so it's ramification. Now become unintentionally a retirement home where the horses really have no purpose. They're stuck in the yards with no shelter. You know, no. But freedom. it's not. It's not entirely bad. Like. Um, they, and there are a lot of great aspects of it, in fact, in, this, in the fact that they actually fed very well. Um, 
but yeah, it's not a, an ideal. Well, I guess the problem with feeding animals very well is they tend to get a little bit fat and a little bit lazy. Yeah, because the activists are quite um, passionate over there, so they have to feed to the thinnest horse in the yard. So there were some really obese horses yeah. in there. Crikey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it is America, you know. If, we, if America is famous for anything, it's obesity and putting things they don't like into prison cells. Um, <laughs> did that impact the way that you then trained those horses? Oh. I guess they were um, used to being in captivity. What happens it, when the fences went down? Well, it changed. Yeah. Uh, like, it, it was a different mindset for us because in, uh, we, when working with the Kaimano, sometimes you can feel a little bit guilty because you're taking them out of the wild and you're putting them into a sense of captivity. In America, because they were in captivity, we were then giving them a sense of freedom. So it was really fun for us because the horses were so grateful and they were so excited to go on adventures and so willing. You could just do anything with them, the coolest horses ever. And Kaimana was a great too, but there's that sense of um, that transition from the wild to domestication can be quite... Um, jarring for a kaimana, or, or, you know. And so the Mustangs have been through the same transition, but they don't necessarily associate it with you, because you're almost the person that's giving them their freedom back at that point. Crikey. Yeah. Um, you ended up, of course, over there having s some wonderful adventures, <laughs> I imagine. You had a 5,000 kilometre road trip yeah. through America, because yeah. it's the kind of place where you can do that. Uh, and again, we have some footage of that as well. To cool the horses down, we headed into the river for a swim, something the horses loved as much as we did. Everything was going well until Jackie and Parker cantered through river weeds and got a fright and leapt sideways, causing the girls to take an unexpected dip. We all had a good laugh. <laughs> well, that looked like fun. <laughs> Did you ever imagine? As, you know, young people with horses here show jumping that you would end up over there doing that? Never in our wildest dreams, but honestly, it's, we've had the best time. And of course, you know, you're always lucky to capture those kind of moments on <laughs> camera when you're making something. But I suspect there's probably quite a lot of stuff that happened off camera. Yeah, actually on that day, the same sort of ride, we were out. And because the mums were on Mustangs, we didn't have enough horses. And one of the girls was running on foot and she was ahead of us and she stops at one point and she goes... I was with her on the, on the horse. Oh, yes, no, she was ahead of us, yeah. Yeah, so she stops and she goes, oh, I forgot there's bears in America. I probably shouldn't get too far ahead. And we're like, oh, you'll be fine. We've, you know, been here for six weeks now and haven't seen a bear yet. And then... Yeah, so I, I caught up with her on my horse and we're running around this corner and we come around the corner and there's this bear standing up on the track and... Kirsty just spun around to me and she says, let me on your horse. And I was like, no way, because if we both get on and then our horse bucks us off, we're both going to die. And so I said, I'll stay here with my horse and you run. So she just turned and ran. And the bear was, it was a smaller bear, so it was okay. It just wandered off, but it was pretty scary. Because we don't tend to have to worry about that kind of no. thing, you know. And I've certainly tramped through the States, and you yeah. do suddenly think, you know, there could be bears and, and snakes. And, of course, you know, as you say, horses react differently to that. Now, you've trained... Uh, you know, horses in Australia as well. The Brumbies over there, they would be, I guess, used to snakes. Yeah, we actually, I've never come face to face with a snake in um, Australia, but I did, we did come across several rattlesnakes in America, which was a bit daunting. Is there a unique personality to horses, no matter where you are, the Kaimanawas, the Brumbies, the Mustangs? Is there a similarity? Or are there, I guess, sort of cultural differences within the way those horses function? Uh, no, I just think... In any breed, and like every single horse is different, you know, and they've like got people. different kind of functions in the family unit. So yeah, but even like some are really timid, and some are brave, and some are cheeky. Manda always seems to get the cheeky ones. In Australia, what, what, what's the situation with their brumbies? 
So actually, the Australia has the world's wildest, the world's largest wild horse population. So New Zealand has, you know, 300 Kaimanawas. America has about 120,000 wild mustangs, and Australia's got a million wild horses. So. Right, a million. Yeah. Because they also have a lot of camels as yeah. well. You yeah. have a sort of Three diversifying million. into, million. you know, breaking yeah. in a few camels. Yeah, we didn't realise that. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, I would never have guessed. But, um, yeah, it's a huge problem over there and really controversial. They're always doing, you know, culls and protests. Uh, so we've been over there in 2016 and spent a lot of time um, working with wild brumbies and then several times back since as well. Now, you obviously have probably just a tiny amount of spare time when you're not dealing with horses. And I cannot believe um, 16 books uh, you have written, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, the first book actually came out just before the TV show. Um, and that was a number one bestseller. And then since then, I've had two to three books published every year what? through Penguin Random House. Horse based? Uh, yeah, so Get we've a got. a bit branching up. <laughs> <laughs> Steam engines? No, not yet. Um, we've got five books based on our wild horse adventures and then also a kids' series about our life as kids growing up. Right. And you've got some of them there as well. Yeah. Is, it, is it, again, that thing, you know, have you ever been somewhere walking along and you've seen a kid? you know, with their little nose buried in the book, living, you know, living your life through your words. Yeah, we get um, actually really gorgeous fan mail all the time from kids that have read them and been inspired. And it's quite cool because the very first book starts with us taming wild horses at like, you know, nine years of age. And I mean, we've never... Is it the kind of thing that you get to do when your parents really like you, but they don't really care all that much about your safety. <laughs> no, well, we grew up with um, very little money and couldn't afford, um, you know, t trained horses. And so there was a whole bunch of wild horses for $50 each. And that's all we could afford. And so we learned the hard way how to tame them. Yeah. And then through that, you, you got into show yeah. jumping. Still doing some show jumping? Yep. Yeah. So I have a team of 26 horses. Did and so <laughs> <laughs> Not as many as Vicky. Vicky has uh, about four times that. So. Crikey. Yeah, um, so yeah, I've got a, a team of about eight this year, Kelly's got two, and Vicky's got a really big team too, so yeah, we're pretty busy with that, but the season doesn't start for another month. Because it's, it's a, just a, a great part of a, a, like a New Zealand subculture, isn't it? You, you know, all these little AMP shows and you see little kids, tiny kids on little horses doing show jumping and then progressing through, you know, of course, the, the glamour names, Mark Todd and various others, at the end of that sort of ramp up of greatness. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, been... a, it's a cool sport. It's really amazing. Like, you, you're having to be responsible for this animal and uh, the people you meet is incredible, the, the adventures and everything you sort of get along the way. Um, and we, it's pretty cool to just travel weekend to weekend to different venues around the country and catch up with the same people. And You know, and you do, you see people and they've, they've got their trucks. And yeah. some of those trucks... I know. You know, uh, we've probably all stared at them. There are trucks that I've seen, horse, horse trucks, with... with Wine fridges. My house isn't as well equipped as some of those trucks. And dishwashers and washing yeah. machines. Because that is the very high end, oh, yeah. isn't Not it? Our and then track. you no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then all the way down to some kind of battered Bedford with a bit of a tarpaulin over it, and the kids sleeping underneath it. Is it a, is it a sort of an egalitarian sport, or is it a kind uh, of a sport where money can buy success? Money can buy success in it, but I think that I think talent in, overrides it. So and in New can, Zealand, you can you can make yourself from nothing because like the opportunities we have in this country compared to Europe and America is pretty awesome. And you can go out to the stations in Gisborne and Hawke's Bay and find pretty awesome horses to compete on. You can. Hey, look, there are awesome, uh, awesome, ho awesome, awesome horses, <laughs> ho awesome horses all over the world. And in fact, I think your upcoming book is about wild horses of the world. Yeah, so um, the last three years I've spent travelling the world, Portugal, Mongolia, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and just been you know, up in the mountains with our Isuzu D-Max and just get into some really rugged places to photograph horses in all sorts of weather and just seen some really incredible things. Great. I think these are some of your photographs that we're seeing now. Yeah, so these ones are in the snowy mountains um, after a blizzard and just, just crazy stuff like on horse behaviour and it's been a really educational uh, experience but also just like really living out the most amazing yeah. adventure. Like, you know, life could be worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when does the book come out? Uh, so that book comes out in October, Marvelous. which I'm it's, really excited about. You know, so from travelling the world with your horses and all of that, what do you do during, during lockdown? Um, well, it was kind of the same for us because the season had finished at that stage so normally we just bring horses into work and kind of go through the motions of getting through winter. Um, so I had two books on deadline. 
Um, yeah, I'm breaking in horses. Just the standard, the standard yeah. old horse-based activities and, 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 and writing. Yeah. yeah, no, we had a lot of fun. So Look, just, yeah, lots of horses is, kind of fills every spare second we have. Frankly, somehow I am um, utterly unsurprised at that statement. <laughs> What's up next for the two of you? Um, so our season, the show jumping season starts um, in about a month. We are looking to make the move down to the lower part of the North Island to be closer to Vicky and to be closer, more central to the sort of show jumping world. And uh, we've got showtime camps, so we travel the country and do camps where people bring their horses and um, have these pretty awesome and then, sort of adventures and lessons. And then we're going to make the most of New Zealand. Obviously we can't travel overseas at the moment, so we're going to be taming wild horses in New Zealand and We're going to um, take our road trip. And and road trip and and you, mean, you know, because we, we do see that, that sense of people touring New Zealand and I've had the, the privilege of, uh, on a very few occasions, doing a little bit of horse riding around the country, but we have things like the cavalcade and, yeah. you know, is there a market along, you know, probably not along the cycle trails, but a similar kind of thing oh, yeah. for people just to go and get into parts of the country they would never otherwise when, see on a horse. When we were, um, like, nine 1911, we travelled the South Island for four months with our horses and rode up through all the high country in Otago. And on the Dunedin and Railway into the Salt Lakes. And God. I mean, there really are some stunning places in this yeah. country. Well, if I ever come back in another life, I want to be like one of the two of you. <laughs> Probably I won't be quite as good a fashion. Um, you know, it's been an incredible journey. And as I say, people can see it in the documentaries. They can read it in any one of your innumerable books or indeed see you around the country and come up and say hi at some of the show jumping events, yeah. the AMP shows and all of these kind of things yeah. over the next few months. Crikey, I'm just going to... I really... This entire thing is making me reassess my life <laughs> options. Thank you, Kelly and Amanda. A uh, huge amount of potential for adventures in our backyards and all of the work that you have done, uh, particularly with the Kaimanawa horses. <laughs>